Hello again everyone and welcome back to Reddit Aliens. I'm John and as always, thank you so much for being here. Good topic, let's do it. People who have had a close call with death share their intimate and crazy stories. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. I'm actually coming up on the third anniversary of the accident this Friday. I was on my way to work just kind of cruising along in the far right lane with my cruise control on as I wasn't in a rush and making good time. I'm not sure if anyone has ever been in a little fender bender and felt that tap, but I felt a little tap and I looked in my side mirror only to see a massive 18 wheelers bumper basically against the back side of my car by my driver's side tire. The next events were a big mystery to me, thanks to TBI, but Future crash reenactments basically show that he overtook my vehicle and merged on top of me, trapping me underneath his trailer. My steering wheel was snapped in two, a pillar was all but disintegrated, and my B pillar was pushed halfway into my seat. I came to as someone was kicking in my passenger window. I was bent over the center console and couldn't sit up because of the truck trailer in my seat. EMS got me out, and I was rushed to the hospital with a head injury and my left hand ripped open. I should have died. Not a single person who has seen my vehicle understands how I survived. 16-year-old farm kid me, stepdad, told me to go pick up a load of corn seed for planting. I'd gone with him many times before and driven the truck, full-ton dually diesel, and hauled light stuff with it. Nobody told me how different it is to haul 10,000 pounds of seed on a big flatbed trailer on gravel. I had a lot of common sense, I was driving slowly and carefully, still, 10,000 pounds pushed me down a gravel hill, skidding, praying to God I stopped before the stop sign at the T intersection on a busy highway. I came to a grinding halt, just as the front of the truck crossed the plain where the gravel turned to asphalt. A semi was coming from one direction and regular cars from the other. I shudder, thinking about what if one, that one, TL, DR, don't let untrained kids tow potentially deadly, heavy trailers with zero training. When I was 12, my hometown's doctor misdiagnosed a testicular torsion as tummy pain and sent me back home despite my protests. My stubborn idiot parents believed him over me and berated me for overreacting when I kept complaining about the pain. Fast forward a week or so, and my testes had died and necrosis was starting to spread and swell. The pain was unbelievable, like a thousand twisting knives across my whole body. I couldn't get up, walk, or even cry properly anymore. I wanted to die so the pain would stop. Parents finally took me to a big city doctor, and the taking they got from the doctor there was legendary. Apparently, testicular torsion is something that needs to be resolved within a day if not less. They had me sitting on it for almost a week because, God forbid, they believed their own kid over that other doctor. And that's how I almost died of necrosis and became a eunuch at 12. Yay. In the 90s, when I was a little kid, my family was on a vacation and the caucus and civil war broke out. We were walking on the road, and I went too far ahead alone. The car stopped, the window rolled down, and a machine gun muzzle pointed at my face. My mom ran ahead, grabbed me, and fell into the bush on the shoulder. The car went on. We were going into the mountains to a sanctuary. I don't entirely know how we got back home. LMAO, okay? So I was getting my teeth cleaned and I got nitrous oxide because I have so many exposed roots. Well, my hygienist at the time was this lovely lady from Minnesota. Kind of flaky, but super sweet. Talked about her family all the time. So I'm in the chair and she hooks up my mask and away we go. I actually fell asleep, except not so much. It turns out Bob had forgotten to turn off the oxygen and had been feeding me straight nitrous. She only noticed because I started gasping for air while unconscious. So that's how I almost died at the dentist. I never saw Barb again, but I tell you, that was the best nap of my life. I was snorkeling. I had my other stuff stored on a rock by the water about three meters high. When I got out, I decided to climb straight up. Almost at the top, the rock I was hoisting myself up on came off, and I fell back first onto the coral. If a friendly wave hadn't come in, I would have broken my back, at least. I had friends over playing video games. A pipe burst, and gas was pouring into the house, but we couldn't smell it downstairs. 
My dad noticed and got us all out of the house. The fire chief got there and took a reading, and the level was so high that he forbade anyone from going in. He said, it's a good thing no one rang the doorbell, because they caused a spark, which would have ignited everything. We had pizza on the way. The delivery guy showed up five minutes after the fire department. In high school, I was late for class coming back from grabbing lunch. As I was speed walking from the car and also cramming a sandwich down my throat, I started choking halfway from the parking lot to the closest building. I dropped the sandwich and started running. I ran into the first building, which was the band building, and it was completely empty. Ran to the next building, and the first two classrooms were locked or empty. I finally made it to the back hallway, and I burst into a physics class where one of my good friends happened to be sitting. I was purple and red and about to pass out. I pointed to my throat, and my buddy jumped over the table and immediately gave me the Heimlich. Five pumps in, and it came out, probably two plus minutes without breathing. Coincidentally, I recently helped him get a job at the company I work at, so I finally feel like I found a way to repay him. That's one of those things and fears that you don't really think about, but it's always in the back of your head. Like, what if you were choking and you were alone, and you had to just burst into random places and hope that somebody knew the Heimlich? And, assuming you work at a good place, that that's cool that that person got a job after saving your life. I got MRSA in my left leg. Being a hardhead, I ignored my wife and daughters about the severity of it. I fell and couldn't get up without their help. They got me to the hospital in time to save my life. I don't remember anything until 10 days later when I woke up with below-the-knee amputation. I'm doing great now, and I'm grateful they made me go to the ER. The first time was when I found myself driving on black ice. The suction from a tractor trailer passing by spun my car around, and I landed nose down in a snow-filled ditch five feet from a bridge. Second time, I got my brakes done on my car as part of regular maintenance. The next day I was driving home from visiting my mother on a downhill slope that ended at a traffic light. I stepped on the brakes, nothing. My foot went right to the floor. I blew through the red light at that intersection going 80 kilometers per hour. Apparently they forgot to bleed the lines. Third time, I had a tumor growing in my colon. I showed symptoms of it for years, which my doctors poo-pooed as PMS. When you're a physically fit 30-ish young woman, stomach and back pain can only be lady stuff, right? The symptoms got worse and worse. The pain was unbearable. Finally, my stomach started to bloat so much that I looked nine months pregnant. I went to my doctor in the ER during that week and each time I was turned away. Finally, on my second visit to the ER, I told them that if I didn't get help, I was getting in my car and driving off to the nearest high bridge I could find. They decided that maybe I was worth an exam and an x-ray. It turns out the tumor had grown so large that I had a 100% bowel obstruction and because of that, the food I had eaten was rotting inside my body. The surgeon told me that without intervention, I was at most 48 hours from death. The negligence of doctors over the years cost me several feet of colon, having to poop into a colostomy bag and ongoing medical issues. There have been other incidents, but not as close. I feel like a cat, and I'm wondering what the next near miss will be before I run out of lives. Me and my friend were on our way to the city. Her car hydroplaned and we flipped six times and hit a light pole. We were both fine, but her car was totaled. We were lucky to have people stop and help, as when we landed upside down, I couldn't open my door, so I ended up having to be pulled out through the passenger window. As scary as it was, I was mostly angry because the paramedics were only there for 10 minutes at most, and all they did was check our blood pressure and heart rate, and then they went on their way. I'm bad at explaining things, so if the paramedic part is confusing, please DM me. I can also DM photos of the car if needed. I was at a small music festival with some friends and my then girlfriend. We were all tripping. It was her first time and things were going well. After a few hours, someone hands me a vape pen and naturally I take a hit. This has never been a problem before, but apparently these crunchy van dwellers don't know how to properly source their shit. I don't know what's in a bootleg vape pen, but I know I'm wildly allergic to it. Suddenly my ears were itchy, then my throat, then breathing got harder, then it was very hard. It was at this point that I croaked at my girlfriend that we should find some Benadryl. After 20 minutes of asking everyone we see, the best we got was an unlabeled pill bottle that someone said, 
I think the little ones are Benadryl. At this point, I'm wheezing and having trouble staying upright. We call 911, and 10 minutes later, what arrives is a guy in a truck who's been sent to inform us that an ambulance will not be coming. We're in the middle of nowhere, Georgia, and literally everyone is effed up. We ask if he can lead us to the nearest ER, and he begrudgingly accepts. I think the fact that I was turning blue earned me some sympathy. So we find the least effed up person we can, and me and my girlfriend pile into his car, and the guy in the truck takes off flying down these dark, twisting country roads. We manage to get to the ER, pop some liquid drill in an IV, and a few minutes later I can breathe again. Thank God I was barely 26 and my parents' insurance still covered me. It wasn't the most scared I've ever been, but definitely the closest to death. Before we started asking for help, I considered just trying to sleep it off since the whole no oxygen thing was making me tired. It would have been a real bad way to end my girlfriend's first acid trip, waking up next to her dead boyfriend. Being born. The doctor decided to pull me out while my mom had only been in the second stage of labor for like 20 minutes and I had barely descended. I placed the forceps wrong on my head over my cheek, which left a nasty gash and a scar and yanked me out for anywhere up to 17 minutes, but we aren't sure because they didn't keep proper notes. My shoulder got stuck on my mom's pelvis, shoulder dystocia, and my collarbone was broken in the process of getting me out. I came out all bruised and blue and had to be resuscitated twice. I also had a hematoma on my head from the pressure of the forceps. My birth left me fully paralyzed in my left arm, and I had to have a 12-hour nerve graft surgery as a baby to give me a little bit of functioning back. I'm still permanently disabled though, and I have 24-7 chronic pain. Yes, it was malpractice. In March of 2021, I started to feel like I had allergies. I thought, wow, there shouldn't be tree pollen out yet. A few days later, I tested positive for COVID. I was isolated at home with what felt like a pretty bad cold. After about a week, it felt hard to breathe, so my doctor sent me to the ER. I slowly hobbled in, weak and hunched over when they took my vitals. My O2 saturation was 79%. Well, they rushed me up to the COVID ICU. My wife wouldn't see me for another 23 days. After a week of progressively getting worse on BiPAP and intensive care, I was medically sedated and paralyzed so I could be intubated and placed on a ventilator. It's all my local hospital could do in the hopes that I would recover. After a few weeks on the ventilator, my lungs started showing massive scarring. The local hospital told my wife she needed to either get me to a transplant hospital or figure out end-of-life plans. I was not going to survive with my damaged lungs. My wife filed paperwork with several transplant hospitals, but no one had a bed available. COVID was overwhelming hospitals everywhere, especially cardiovascular ICUs. My wife eventually got in touch with an incredible pulmonologist who had previous success with a couple of other patients and wanted to take my case. I was airlifted to her hospital and kept stable on the ventilator for another week, totaling five and a half weeks on the ventilator. I was transitioned to ECMO, one of the highest forms of life support, to stabilize me and get me ready for a hopeful lung transplant. After a few days, the social worker evaluated me through family interviews and got me scored and listed with UNOS. Two days later, a matching set of lungs was available. My wife got the call from the surgeon that he was going to perform the transplant through the night as it would take around 10 hours to complete. A couple days later, I was awakened from my six and a half week coma with the words, Mr. Morse, we're the lung transplant team. Congratulations, you've got new lungs. I didn't know where I was, why I got new lungs, or why I was physically couldn't move, coma atrophy, but that's a longer version of my story. Almost two and a half years later, you'd never know I went through any of this unless I told you. My life has forever changed, but my wife and I are still here to tell the story. Nice try, COVID. I ain't dead yet. The journey continues. Most recently, getting pregnant. My baby was diagnosed with a congenital heart defect in utero, one that would likely kill him shortly after birth without intervention. A fun fact we learned during my pregnancy is that there are no pediatric cardiac surgeons in my state. I was perfectly healthy, except for a lot of swelling. At 37 weeks, my husband and I drove four hours to the next state over to transfer care there for his birth and eventual surgery. I was incredibly sick, 
and the trip took us seven hours because we had to stop so much. I had a doctor's appointment the next morning and my husband asked if I wanted to eat first and I said no, I'd rather eat after. I lived to regret those words because I got admitted to that doctor's appointment with HELP syndrome. I wasn't allowed to eat because I was being prepared for an emergency c-section.